Now to the United States, where increasingly attention is turning to who's putting their hand up to be a presidential candidate. Hillary Clinton's dramatic loss in 2016 has certainly inspired many women to throw their hat into the ring on the Democratic front. Elizabeth Warren is the first woman to announce a bid for the 2020 Democratic nomination, followed by fellow senators Kirsten Gillibrand, Amy Klobuchar and Kamala Harris. But what sort of treatment can female candidates this time around expect from the media? Joining me now is Doris Truong, the Head of Diversity and Training at the Pointer Institute for Media Studies in St Petersburg in Florida. Doris, thanks for your time. Research carried out by the uh, Northeastern University's Journalism School has revealed that women on the 2020 campaign trail are already being treated in a harsher fashion than their male peers. So why is this happening? So I think one of the things that's happening is that there's kind of an ingrained way that US journalists think about women versus men. And this also stretches to the business world because politics is a business in and of itself, right? When you think about how a man can be considered assertive as a positive trait, that same woman can be considered aggressive. A man can be passionate about what he is trying to get across as a point, and that same woman would be described as shrill in um, a similar situation. So we're sort of seeing that play out in the way that stories are being told about these candidates. Uh, we see that people are referring to the families of the women a lot more than they necessarily delve into the families of the men. But one of the other things is that a lot of these women are not necessarily well known on the national stage. And so I think that that's where the media falls into these tropes of how do we profile someone that no one has ever met before. And certainly from this side of the Atlantic, we're hearing a lot more about Beto O'Rourke, Bernie Sanders, Peter Buttigieg rather than Kamala Harris or Elizabeth Warren, yet alone their policies. So what impact does this have on the voter? Well, I think that we're still, as a country, kind of recovering from 2015 when there were almost as many candidates who had declared by this time in the, uh, in the election cycle. So as of Tuesday, there were 20 people who had declared for the Democratic, uh, who had said that they were going to run for from the Democratic Party and six of those are women, as you had mentioned. So um, we've got this saturation of the field when the um, presidential campaigning has not really started in earnest yet. And I think that people are trying to lean on names or stories that might resonate with their readers. So when they're seeing that people are interested in those stories about Mayor Pete, then they're gonna be running more stories about Mayor Pete. They're gonna be using that coverage of him. He's very media friendly. He has lots of interesting sound bites. You may know that people in the United States were fascinated by him being able to speak fluently in Norwegian, and that's partially because a lot of Americans speak only one language. So um, there's that story that's very compelling. Um, but, so, what, but, but what impact is this going to have on the voter in the long term? I think in the long term, the voter has to be somewhat more responsible for themselves and trying to find information that they can look at all different sides of how that candidate is being portrayed. Because you're going to see that same story over and over again. One of the stories about Amy Klobuchar, who's one of the candidates, is that she had berated her staff and had gone so far as to eat a salad with a comb. And that's something that just really resonated with people because it was such an unusual anecdote. And it doesn't really speak to what kind of a legislator she would be or what kind of a presidential candidate she might be. Doris, do you think American newsrooms are even aware of this as a problem? I think that there's a little bit of more heightened sensitivity to it, partially because I've seen in the comments threads that readers are coming in and saying that they don't want the same kind of coverage that they thought potentially doomed Hillary Clinton's campaign, that there was a lot of complaint about her being a shrill woman. Uh, and she was this groundbreaking female candidate in the United States, right? So that's what I'm seeing from readers saying, hey, media, pay attention and don't go down the same road that you went down in 2015 and 2016. So as a result, what needs to be done at this stage to address the issue? What steps need to be taken by media outlets? I think it's always important to get different people the opportunity to cover the candidates because they're going to bring different perspectives to the story. 
but also to think about if you're going to cover that somebody is berating their staff, then are you going to be looking at a male candidate in the same way and the way that he behaves around his staff? Um, I think it's always good to think about whether you're covering different people with the same kind of lens. So as you look through the coverage of the um, Jeff Bezos divorce, which is um, a big business story, right? People frequently refer to his wife, Mackenzie, as just that, uh, Jeff Bezos' wife, when she was a successful businesswoman in her own right and helped with the, the launch of Amazon. And so even when the divorce was announced, people still referred to her as Jeff Bezos' wife, even though her name had been in the news and people would have known who Mackenzie Bezos is. So there's a little bit of catering to search engines and um, trying to get these headline words that they think people are going to click on without necessarily thinking about people that they're covering in the news as individuals in their own right. Doris, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.